Hey everybody, my name is Chris Barassa. I'm a creative director and an artist at uh, Red Hook Studios, and we made a game called Darkest Dungeon, and I'm here today to talk about character design, and to a lesser extent, monster design. Uh, this is not like a, strictly speaking, an art talk or like how to draw or paint. It's more a look at the sort of creative headspace I tried to create for myself to generate the most interesting uh, and, and memorable characters that that I could. I'm certainly not the best artist in the world, um, but this is a subjective kind of look at uh, what was going on for me uh, during that that process. Um, I don't really like highly prescriptive talks, uh, so this isn't an instruction manual so much as just hopefully there's some takeaways in here that will help you um, with your own work. So uh, well, let's get started. Um, before we dive into actual character design, I uh, wanted to circle up and just make sure that everybody watching has at least a loose understanding of what our game is. Uh, Darkest Dungeon is a turn-based um, roguelike, roguelite, uh, sort of the, the on-the-floor pitch back when we were allowed to go to PAXs and that kind of thing, was XCOM meets Dark Souls with sort of HP Lovecraft in the middle. You inherit sort of a tainted plot of land from an ancestor, and you're tasked with grouping heroes into parties, sending them out, killing monsters, and having them come back to town with treasure. Pretty standard fare as far as a dungeon crawler goes, but where we really tried to differentiate ourselves was to focus on the human cost of that lifestyle, that adventuring uh, lifestyle. Heroes get sick, they get positive and negative quirks, they accrue stress uh, because this would be pretty much an awful way to live. And when they get back to town, you've got to send them drinking or gambling or meditating or praying or flagellating, anything it takes to sort of bring their stress levels back down. So in a sense, uh, it's like a medieval hockey coach simulator uh, where you're cycling your lines and keeping everybody in fighting shape. Uh, we're very, very fortunate uh, that the game has sold quite well and we've been able to support it with a few DLCs, I think four now, and uh, we're, we're hard at work on the sequel. So that's Darkest Dungeon. Uh, I think an important thing when you go to design characters is to have a clear idea of the art direction, um, the visual and aesthetic rules that are going to sort of establish the context uh, where these characters are, are going to live. Uh, without them, you're sort of designing blind. And so when I started doing early work on, on Darkest Dungeon, the, the first thing I focused on before I worried about any specific uh, character or monsters was to try to figure out the, the artistic DNA and, and to work up uh, a style that I felt would help inform my later sort of more specific design choices. So really Darkest Dungeon has four core influences. Um, medieval woodcuts uh, and illuminated manuscripts, I found the flatness kind of eerie and unsettling they would show these like people being boiled alive and stuff. And it's all like the perspective is so flat that it kind of just gave it this uh, unsettling kind of vibe. Um, I'm a huge classic uh, horror fan, Hammer Horror, uh, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, uh, all that sort of family of campy, schlocky, heavy handed horror films. They, they just commit to their subject matter so entirely that so the melodrama is I find very endearing and I and I wanted to sort of embrace uh, some of the things that they do in the game and uh, you know gothic stuff obviously there's a sort of a, a quiet unease that that gothic architecture and paintings kind of represent and it's pretty much an evergreen source of inspiration for for dungeon crawlers so I couldn't really proceed without including some amount of that uh, the fourth influence though was, uh, was something a little bit more modern. Uh, I wanted to look back and sort of uh, pull from my, my favorite comic book artists that I liked growing up. Mike Mignola, Guy Davis, Chris Batchelor were probably the main three that I looked at uh, in context of Darkest Dungeon. They all use black uh, really, really well to help frame, shape the action and um, let a lot of stuff disappear into that sort of empty space and I felt like there was a lot there that I could learn from and that would really help reinforce the, the, the creative goals of the game. So at the time, um, this is pushing eight years ago, I didn't draw in a comic style at all. I was sort of, you know, freelancing and working for companies and, and using that sort of 
generally fantasy painter esque type house style that you know is is pretty much the baseline for for a lot of this kind of work. Uh, so I had to train myself to work in a style that I knew that the game wanted. Um, I had done the intellectual exercise of collecting all the reference. I kind of had a loose idea of where I wanted to take it, but then it took practice to actually, you know, go from a lot of these more rendered uh, pieces to something much more graphic. And I, you know, I didn't have a background in comics or anything like that, so I was just trying to figure it out as as I went along. And I mentioned that because the early work was really crude and and not of any decent quality. I'm I'm basically making fun of myself by posting this. It's really embarrassing, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's rough. But you can see that I'm trying to figure out here um, what ingredients work for me in practice without being tied to this notion that I have to design a specific character, monster, or set. I'm really just splashing around, um, trying to open my brain up to the uh, the types of art direction rules that that will ultimately inform what's appropriate in terms of in terms of design and so after you know a, a month or two of doing this um i settled on on a style sort of typified in, in this kind of an image uh, and and basically the art direction for the game was kind of uh, more or less established uh, and there's four key kind of ingredients to it I didn't want to show eyes because I felt like um, everybody who ends up in the game, all the heroes are sort of like broken or empty or seeking atonement or, or redemption in some way. And I felt like uh, not showing their eyes gave them a certain emptiness, uh, a certain hopeless or sort of questing quality that I felt um, was kind of uh, unique and appropriate. Uh, there's a lot of hard edges. Uh, oh, I'm jumping ahead. But anyway, there is a lot of hard edges. Uh, there's nothing really smooth or organic um, that's good in the game. And uh, that was really to sort of uh, create this sense or, or reinforce the idea that there was a lot of uncompromising uh, gameplay. Um, the pooling blacks sort of uh, evoke the sense of being swallowed up by darkness or, or madness. Uh, which is also reinforced um, mechanically. And uh, the work was a little messy, um, you know, gritty. Uh, the, the lines aren't perfect, things don't line up. Uh, there's, there's sort of a rough woodcut quality to it. And that was basically to emphasize this idea that all the characters are, are flawed in some way. Uh, the, the heroes are human is kind of one of the internal taglines that we used for the game. And I felt like the art could evoke that by having a flawed quality itself. So it's like a flawed art style describing flawed people. Uh, and I liked that, that sort of um, pairing, I guess. So with, uh, with an art style, you know, in mind, and again, like in hindsight, it looks like I had this all figured out like beat to beat to beat, but it was all sort of happening a little bit organically, but this is generally fairly accurate to the, to the journey. Um, with a so with a decent art style kind of figured out and some rough rules i could kind of turn my head to actually designing characters now <laughs> i was working a lot and it's not like i had these three you know values up on my wall like with a picture of people doing a dragon boat race at sunrise you know like it wasn't that condensed at the time in hindsight i feel like this is a fairly uh, accurate look at, at what, what I was thinking about and the sort of um, the priorities in my mind as I was designing uh, characters and, and, and monsters in this in this game. Uh, but certainly at the time it was a lot more soupy and, and organic. Um, but you know, hindsight, you can kind of reorganize things a little bit and make them sound like you knew what you were doing. Welcome to my talk. <laughs> Uh, so I thought what I would do is run through kind of each of these in context of the game and, uh, and just try to reflect and, and underscore uh, how I felt they added value to the process. An icon, by definition, is like an abstraction, right? It's a, it's a simplification, uh, but it remains an accurate representation of the essence of a thing. So a successful icon is really... Um, sort of uh, elegant, reductive thinking. It's a distillation of something. And, and I sort of believe that all the characters in pop culture that have an enduring appeal 
are all characters that have prioritized iconification over realism. Uh, Mickey Mouse, I mean, maybe he's not so relevant anymore, but um, Batman, <laughs> uh, all, a lot of our favorite, most beloved franchises and, and, and pop culture uh, characters um, are so beloved and memorable and repeatable and, and uh, prevalent because they have simple core iconic concepts that are able to sort of echo across all versions of the character. I think a thing that's a little bit daunting in games is that as the technology is able to represent higher and higher fidelity, the pressure when designing original characters is to express that fidelity by having extremely complex designs. And my concern is that that erodes our ability to make striking visually iconic characters. The detail and surface disruption don't really add to or, or replace a good iconic design. And I think like, you know, here, these modern versions of these two characters, uh, Mega Man and Batman, um, don't add anything really to the to the essence of what this character is. They're sort of a more complex expression of a core idea. So when you're designing a character, I think you have to go back to the root and, and try to express the idea of that character extremely simply and not rely on the, the modern um, visual sensibility of, of detail and, and, um, and, and, and extreme nuance, I guess. I don't even know if I should talk over the slide because I'm going to rant and I don't want to get in trouble with anybody. But I grew up with I grew up with Optimus Prime. He was like one of my favorite dudes, and it was like in the you know the late '80s, which is sort of like the the one of the high points of the American Empire. And then you know this semi truck, which is you know like America runs on trucks, and he's red, white, and blue, and he's got massive pecs and a ripped six pack. Um, Optimus Prime was like the man, right? He was your dad. He was your best friend. Um, they managed to create this like this powerful, simple, chunky design that kids could draw that sticks in your head that looked heroic and tough. But at the same time, there's like a softness in Optimus Prime's face that that reminds you that he's going to be on on the right side of, of the ethical dilemma. Um, and the result is like a very aspirational character. And it's a robot. It's not even a person. I think it's an extremely successful character design. And then you look at the modern remake, and it looks just looks like a fistful of cutlery. They, they managed to lose the forest for the trees with this transition. And I, and I think this is a, a real, it's something that sticks in my mind a lot. Uh, there's nothing left of all of that powerful, symbolic strength of the original design. There's nothing left of it in, in, this, in this remake. It just looks like an angry knife drawer with a shield. And, and I, can't, I can't draw this character. I can't remember this character. It's just a pile of gears and wires and sharp edges. And um, as a result, if this was the first version of Optimus Prime, no one would care about Optimus Prime. Uh, no one would be able to remember him. I, I learned this lesson about iconification. Um, I don't know, midway through my career, I was working at a cartoon place and I had to design this character, sort of like a classic Nick Fury. Um, and he had like power armor on, but the, the whole idea was that he kept his original Mark I armor uh, because he, you know, it had seen him through so many tough times or whatever. So the first couple passes of the character, I drew like all these nicks and scratches and cuts on the armor. And uh, it was like these toy guys came in and they're like, no, 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 we can't make this. This isn't a toy. Put one scratch on his armor and leave it at that. And I mean, generally speaking, these guys had terrible ideas, but that moment really sticks in my mind and, and it remains a really clear memory for me because uh, it kind of clicked like an elegant expression, a, a simple striking cut in the armor tells the story that this is his original armor, but it does it in a memorable way. He's the guy with the diagonal slash. That's all he needs. It is the most iconic reductive expression of the idea that the armor is worn, as opposed to a high fidelity, 
high detail um, version of like all these little scratches and cuts everywhere that amount to um, a poorer expression of, of the core concept. So I knew heading into character design on Darkest Dungeon that um, iconification was, was extremely important and it was something that I wanted to keep at the forefront uh, of my mind. A trope or like a stereotype um, is like a shorthand for to quickly convey a, a lot of shared information. Uh, and it's valuable in that sense. Like if I say rogue, like presumably all you nerds who are watching this, um, we, we would generally have the same idea of what a rogue is, right? Like um, dark hood, double daggers, um, invisibility, uh, midriff, like, you know, the, 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 the idea of rogue is, is generally agreed upon in the, this circle of people. I would, I would bet almost any amount of money. Um, the problem though, is that, uh, tropes can become prison cells when you're trying to think, uh, creatively, they become a bounding box that's very, very difficult to break out of. Uh, so if I tell you, look, you know, I'm going to design you a rogue, but they don't have uh, double daggers, they don't turn invisible, they don't backstab for critical damage, uh, no midriff, um, you're going to say, well, Chris, that's a shitty rogue, I don't want to play as that rogue. But if I say I'm going to design a highwayman, you don't know what that is, I get to tell you, and I can't be wrong because I'm the one telling you. And then it helps me too, because I have a greater breadth of conceptual space to work in. I don't have to feel chained to the idea that we've all agreed is a rogue or a paladin or a healer or a fighter. And this is a particularly murky area for RPGs because the fantasy genre is evergreen. Um, so you want to be familiar enough to participate in that sort of cultural appetite, but you also want to make sure that you're doing your best to stand slightly apart uh, from the sort of more mundane or, or derivative uh, ideas of, of what characters are. So I think it's really important to be aware of the tropes in the space that you're working. And uh, it, it was a little bit tricky for us, but by renaming characters, something as simple as a name carries a tremendous amount of weight. So we have a Hellion in Darkest Dungeon. She's a barbarian. But we don't call her a barbarian, and that just gives us a bit of room to tell players what a Hellion is. And if we don't do some of the things that a barbarian normally would, or we do some different things, that's okay because we're creating something a little bit different, a little bit fresh. And it all just, it all, in a lot of cases for us, it just started with a name. And I think there's a really cool sense of like wonderment and discovery that you can bring to people, to your audience, um, by not sort of treading the same exact roads um, as so many other, uh, you know, amazing and interesting games out there. Uh, but I think it's important as a, as a designer to be able to um, embrace a, as large a possibility space as you can, especially early on. So be aware of tropes. I tried to be, and that's why we ended up with characters like a plague doctor, a leper, an antiquarian, an abomination. These are not typical fantasy fair, and uh, it wouldn't have been possible if we weren't constantly challenging ourselves to try to think just a little bit left to center. Somewhat related, but a little bit different, is uh, the idea of outside influences. So visually, if you're referencing work that's already been done, uh, in the same vein that you're working, uh, you can very quickly get creative stagnation and, uh, and end up with very derivative concepts and, and character designs. If you are only concerning yourself with work done in the space that you're working, I think it's too much of a limitation. So for instance, in Darkest Dungeon, the big challenge was how do I come up with like interesting and visually kind of memorable low fantasy characters? Cause like low fantasy sucks, right? It's, it's just muddy, miserable people in beat up armor being miserable. It's like a homogenous group of miserable, muddy people. And 
and nothing stands out there. It's really hard to find something. Like I can do a different shoulder pad design, but it's still muddy and miserable. And it's going to ultimately just be a sea of that. That's the, the realistic um, source material for, for Darkest Dungeon. Um, so I, I felt like I had to challenge myself to look beyond uh, what was historically accurate and certainly what was being produced in, in other games because it had already been produced. And I wanted something a little bit fresh. We'd already kind of started with this graphic uh, style from comic books. And it kind of dawned on me that, uh, you know, I could, I could double down on that and I could start thinking about uh, superheroes. Uh, I could look outside of the genre, uh, low fantasy, fantasy even, and try to find some inspiration in an area completely unrelated that I could bring back and incorporate into the DNA of what I was working on. Uh, and so that's what I did. Uh, you can see we've got a couple of the Darkest Dungeon guys here all lined up. And uh, no word of a lie, this is what I was thinking about when I was designing them. Uh, the, the Highwayman's hook nose and scarf, you know, I, I thought about the shadow from like, I think it's from the 30s, uh, sort of a Batman thing, but he had guns. Um, I hate bards. <laughs> I don't mind bards tail. I don't like bards. Uh, I know that some of you probably play bards and I don't think you should. I think bards are terrible but I wanted a bard and I wanted it to be cool. So I made a gesture. Uh, you can see I'm, I'm pulling a different name. I'm trying to reset expectations a little bit just on that front alone. And then I'm trying to leverage these kind of emo, you know, the crow and Grendel and, and give it, um, give the character like its own kind of edge uh, as opposed to just like a jolly guy with a, the jolly instrument. Uh, the, the bounty hunter character, I, you know, thought immediately of Batman and, uh, the leopard being like tough and armored and strong. Uh, I really like the Iron Man kind of mouth shape. Um, Rorschach and the Daredevil uh, costume kind of played a bit of a role in the in the flagellant design. And of course, I looked at uh, at the Hulk for the abomination. Less visually on that one, um, but certainly thematically. So this provided me with enough fresh ideas that I could then mash up with this low fantasy stuff and start trying to eke out designs that were a little bit punchier than if I was just referencing historical armor or other RPGs to, to sort of generate our, our cast of characters. Uh, I even took it further. I grew up in the, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and at that time, Chris Claremont was writing a lot of the X-Men books. And it was this like insane like they were in Africa and then they were in Mojo World and then they were cheating on each other and having affairs and forgetting, losing their memory and fighting Sentinels and ultimate timelines and then coming back together. These massive sprawling storylines and the X-Men themselves weren't just like a team of five people. They were this like huge cast. Uh, they were diverse. They didn't get along. They worked together sometimes. Uh, and, and I, I remember after going through a couple of the character designs and thinking a lot about superhero comics, I'm like, really what I'm doing is I'm trying to make medieval X-Men, you know, at, at its core. So I, my job at that point became, how do I strike a balance between low fantasy implementation of superhero ideals? And, and how can I leverage that to create like this group of distinct iconic medieval X-Men? Um, and, and that's really how I, how I started to think about it, visually uh, and, and also thematically. Uh, we took it even one step further. Uh, you know, every superhero has like an origin story. It's a huge important part of what makes a superhero. It's the reason why they ostensibly become a superhero. Um, and so I thought, well, what better way than to create these origin stories very much along a superhero vein uh, for our cast. And so I worked with uh, Trudy Castle and we, uh, we developed these um, single one page comics uh, to sort of tell the background of each of these heroes. And because it's Darkest Dungeon and everyone's flawed, I made sure that all their backstories are sufficiently traumatic and terrible. The Highwayman kills a woman and child, robbing the wrong stagecoach. The Crusader can never return to his family because war changes him and he doesn't even want to. Uh, you know, the grave robber is a, essentially a trophy wife who turns to stealing from the dead to maintain her lifestyle. 
uh, after her abusive husband kind of passes away. So they all have these kind of gateway events that, that get them into their lifestyle, which ultimately lands them in the sort of cursed Hamlet Twilight Zone hub of, of the game looking for something. Uh, so by concentrating visually on just a few important details, a few iconic details for each hero, by sidestepping established fantasy tropes and uh, to try to create a bigger possibility space for myself and, and looking beyond the immediate subject matter of, you know, fantasy RPGs, uh, I came up with this group of diverse and punchy and colorful characters that can be reimagined and, and enlarged in terms of scale, you know, beyond just the game sprites uh, and still maintain their, uh, their identity. My son is playing outside. It's a pandemic. Um, so uh, that was the process on the heroes. Um, I feel like generally it was a it was a success, and I'm quite proud of this this like creative effort here. Um, and I tried to replicate the same thing when it, when I came to uh, came to monsters. So I pulled two examples from the game that I thought would be cool to talk about. So again, I want to think about reductivism and and, and iconography. I want to make sure that I reframe whatever trope I'm working in just to give myself a little bit more room. And I want to find influences that aren't directly related to the content I'm working on. So as I mentioned, um, it is a, it is a pandemic, been a rough year. Um, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but, uh, if you have orcs in your game, you're, you're, you're never going to do a better orc than what's already been done. It, it's over for orcs, like between Lord of the Rings, uh, Games Workshop and World of Warcraft, like forget it. If you're making orcs, they're going to be worse orcs than the orcs that you can get on Google. Here's the orcs you can get on Google. Good luck to you if you're trying to include orcs in your game. You'll never do it. That's my opinion. Uh, but it, Darkest Dungeon is a fantasy game. I wanted orcs. I wanted that faction, th that sort of feral, savage, um, filthy kind of faction. I wanted those ideas represented in the game but I knew I couldn't do orcs. Like I'm, I'm a shitty artist. Like I can't keep up with what's going on here. So I had to find a way to kind of make orcs mine or ours, you know, proprietary to the, to the IP. So I looked outside fantasy and, and, and even mythology. And I just started looking at animals and uh, you know, I, I learned some things about pigs. They're um, the gross, their flesh is actually most like human flesh, which is a weird fact that I managed to even include in one of the, the boss like backstories. Um, they've been used to dispose of bodies in many unsavory murders. <laughs> and, uh, and I also, uh, I remembered reading this book called The House on the Borderlands uh, by William Hope Hodgson, which was like, this guy's like stuck in a house and he's being stalked by like an albino pig. And I thought that was just like a really scary idea. And so I tried to pull uh, pig and orc ideas and mash them together and sort of create a faction that would, you know, belong to Darkest Dungeon, uh, but still echo the, the primal feral uh, tusks and muscle sort of vibe that you get out of orcs in, in traditional RPG spaces. Uh, and I think the result was... I think one of our most interesting enemy factions, because certainly it feels uh, orcish, but also you know unique to our game. And this exercise was valuable because it it resulted in some monster designs that I don't think I would have gotten to if I was just focused on making uh, orcs, um, like a pig centaur, swinator, <laughs> um, a giant hulking mass of like you know guts spilling out. Like you can't do this stuff with orcs, but you can with magic pigs. And, uh, and so I did. The first DLC that we did for Darkest Dungeon was called The Crimson Court. And I had put off doing vampires for a really long time. And you know, at this point, the game had witches, werewolves, fishmen, pigmen, um, skeletons, uh, 
fungus people, blobs, wolves, maggots, you know, vampires are one of the only monsters we didn't have, but I couldn't bring myself to do like, like either a campy Count Dracula or like a sexy demonic vampire. These are all the expected moves when it comes to making vampires. Um, and, and I didn't want to be sort of chained up by, by those ideas. So I decided to really think about what a vampire was. And there's two main things that a vampire does. It is decadent and it drinks blood. So I asked myself, what exists in nature that drinks blood? This is my favorite slide. Um, <laughs> And I, and I took the name vampire and we, we called them bloodsuckers because that's really what they are. Uh, ticks, mites, black flies, mosquitoes, these things drink blood. And I thought, okay, maybe instead of bats and fangs, we can go with like proboscis and, and, and more insect-like qualities to deliver on a bloodsucking vibe without repeating you know, what everybody else is thinking a vampire is. When it came to decadence, uh, I did a little bit of research and I stumbled on this crazy documentary. There's been a couple of them actually about like the club kids party scene in New York. I don't, I don't even know what a club is. I've never been to one. <laughs> I'm super lame. I'm in a basement, but um, <laughs> I guess in New York in like the late nineties, this, there was this club scene and one of these promoter guys started hosting these wild parties and they started out as like almost performance art with elaborate costumes and crazy stuff and everybody's on ecstasy. And then gradually, you know, the appetite to push things further and further took over. And so the drugs got harder, the, the, the scene got like way darker and, and the whole thing culminates in um, the murder of, of this guy by this club promoter and they chopped him up and threw him in the Hudson river. And then this guy went on the run. So it's a wild story. It has nothing to do with vampires or fantasy RPGs or games or anything like that. But this idea that affluence and art could give way to um, really, really dark extremes, I, I felt like was, was fascinating. So I combined this idea of blood sucking bugs with rich party kids and uh, you know dressed it in some age appropriate French clothing and we ended up with the uh, the bloodsucker faction for the Crimson Court. And I uh, again, I worked with uh, with uh, Trudy on these, and in the tagline kind of became like bugs are wearing people, like people are wearing wigs, and the the design choices uh, visually are all quite defensible. The lavish clothes are ruined and muddy. They live in a swamp. It sort of shows a fall from grace. There's a limited palette and only the reds really pop. And that's because that's all this, these people, the, these monsters are, are thinking about is red blood. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't have a Count Dracula, but we had a Countess and she becomes the ultimate boss in that DLC. And she kind of is like a semi-beautiful kind of strange creature and then mutates into this horrible hive mother kind of thing. Um, I think it was quite a great exercise and reinforced to me that uh, whenever you're stuck looking for ideas, you, you have to look beyond the immediate subject matter uh, that you're working from. So I hope I've demonstrated my philosophy um, that I kind of have developed and come to rely on. Um, certainly I'm using it as much as I can uh, on, the, on the sequel. Um, but really you can reduce it even more. You just can even get simpler. It, this is really all I'm saying, this entire talk, I could have just skipped to this and left this up on the screen for 30 minutes. You might have even gotten the same amount of information out of it. It's about asking questions. It's about asking what the most important thing is in the design. It's about challenging your assumptions. Why that weapon? Why that body type? Why that skin tone? Why that kind of armor? Focusing on only the things that matter and the rest just exists to support those things. And asking questions of yourself and of your characters forces you to defend your creative choices, which I think ultimately strengthens your designs and makes you more aware of the tropes and stereotypes that might be either holding you back or that you wanna to leverage to, uh, to bring some familiarity um, to your work. So this is a, 
the leper from Darkest Dungeon. I think I think this is probably a career high for me. I think he's probably he's not my favorite character in the game, but I think he's probably one of the better designs. Um, and I say that because everything is defensible on, on this character. There's there's everything is here for a reason and deliberate. Um, the broken sword represents that he's a you know a broken man. He's got this idealized like gilded muscular chest plate, but you know underneath he looks like a mess. Um, he's he's wrapped up. He's half kind of shrouded, which means he's kind of got like one foot in the grave because he knows he's dying, and uh, you know he's got the gold colors because he used to be a he used to be a king, and he you know abdicates his throne because he's still got some some nobility and class left in him. Uh, I think visually, this character is about the mask, the shroud, and the chest plate. Everything else, the, the, the belt, whether or not he has knee pads, um, none of that, the gloves, none of it really matters. The only thing that, that matters about this character, again, is the, is the face, the shroud, and the chest plate. And as long as you have those things, uh, it will pass the fan art test. You can see here, like, um, this is just a smattering of some of the fan art we've gotten. Um, but the leper has been reduced here to just pure pixels, but you can still tell it's the same character. And you can render that character extremely realistically, and it's still the same character. So I think when you're designing uh, heroes and, and monsters of, of any kind in any time period for any game, you want to be able to reduce them to their most elegant and most simple so that they can stick in people's minds and people want to draw them, want to recreate them, and, and the design can sort of survive and thrive in, uh, in multiple styles across, um, you know, the entirety of the, the internet. Um, a strong character design invites stylization and, and reinterpretation, but it maintains the anchoring qualities, the iconic, interesting, atypical qualities endure so the design is always recognizable. And I think that's the mark of, a, of successful character design. This is me on Twitter. If you want to say hello, uh, please by all means do. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for coming.